Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Lionel Barrymore in The Horse and Buggy Doctor on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we give you a dramatization of a book which has endeared itself to a great many readers, The Horse and Buggy Doctor by Dr. Arthur E. Hertzler. I suppose there's no one who comes into our lives more impressively and memorably than the doctor. And those early doctors who did their wonderful work against all the hardships of life in the country 40 years ago have won and deserve a special place in our hearts. The horse and buggy doctor of our story was of this type, old-fashioned by modern standards, but good and true by any standards. To play the part of this fine old character, we are honored indeed to have with us tonight one of the most distinguished actors of our time, Lionel Barrymore. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it for words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste. That hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize. And it tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Our star Lionel Barrymore is appearing tonight by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of Westward the Women, starring Robert Taylor, Denise Darcell, and Hope Emerson. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Dr. Arthur E. Hertzler's The Horse and Buggy Doctor, starring Lionel Barrymore. It was a small town 40 years ago, a sort of mutual gathering together of a few hundred souls against the loneliness of the Midwestern prairie. Buggies and buckboards splashed along Main Street through the deep mud of a January thaw. One such horse and buggy turned off Main Street and up First Avenue and came to a stop outside a large frame house. A young man was waiting by the front gate, and to him the buggy appeared to be without occupant, until he noticed a pair of trousered legs dangling over the side of the seat. The young man stepped closer. Yes, the owner of the legs was fast asleep. <coughs> Hello. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, we own this? I, I beg your pardon, sir. Are you the doctor? Hmm? Oh, <laughs> must be. I haven't heard of any other around here. Well, then I'm, I'm David Grant, sir. Professor Newhouse wrote you about me. Uh-huh. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Mind helping me carry my instruments in the house? Oh, gladly, sir. Yeah, uh, are. Hammer, wire cutter, shovel, revolver. <laughs> All right, Bass, head for the stable. Uh, doctor, you, you said instruments. You surely don't mean these. No, I certainly did. They're as handy as my scalpel any day. <laughs> Oh, don't look so horrified, son. I carry a regular medical kit, too. When you've had a bit of country practice, you'll understand what it's all about. Yes, sir. Professor Newhouse said it would be excellent training for me. And all he said? And that you would teach me more than I learned in my whole internship, sir. Ah, Professor Newhouse is a sentimental old fool. <laughs> and my best friend... Mrs. Peters? Yes, doctor. I'm fixing.
fixing your breakfast right now. Fine, fine. Don't forget to set an extra plate. I've already fed him. Oh, and told him all about your liver complaint, I suppose. <laughs> He'll never make a doctor. Oh, why not? Why? Just look at him. Breakfast will be ready in ten minutes. What's the matter with the way I look, sir? Come on, I'll show you my office. Right off the parlor here. Um, but, Doctor, what, what's the matter with my look? Ah, nothing, son, nothing at all. And everything. You're too young. You're too dignified. You, and you look too much like a doctor. Doctor? Oh, oh, uh, come in, Dave. Come on in. I, I'd like your consultation on an interesting case. Yes, sir. Uh, Emily? This is Dr. David Grant, Miss uh, Emily Denslow. How do you do, Miss Denslow? Hello. You mustn't take Dr. Fred seriously. I'm not an interesting case. I'm perfectly well. Uh, that's just where the complication comes in, my dear. Your symptoms are the very sort every young doctor wants to treat. Youth complicated by beauty. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, doctor, there's a Luther Whitcomb waiting outside. He, he says it's uh, quite urgent. Oh, uh, well, then I'll be going. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. I'm happy to have met you, Mr. Grant. Goodbye, Emily. Goodbye, goodbye. What's the matter, Dave? She called me Mr. Grant. Everybody calls me Mr. instead of Doctor. I've been here almost a week, and no one acts as if I knew how to read a thermometer. Oh, it takes time, sir. Yes, but how many years, Doctor? You have had a steady stream of patience, sir, but as far as I'm concerned... I, I want to talk to you about that, Dave. So I wish you'd go down and stand on the corner of Main and First Street so I can get some rest. Stand on the corner? Yeah, and let the curious see what you look like. That's why I've had so many office calls this week. What? You mean that's why Emily... Uh, Miss uh, Denslow? Sure, sure. The excuse she used was to get a prescription for her father. Oh. Now, suppose you tell Luther Whitcomb I'll see him. Uh, doctor, is uh, Miss Denslow going with anyone? No one in particular. Luther! Um, do, do people around here dance much, Doctor? Yeah, every Saturday night. Luther! Oh, it, it, it's my wife. She's getting worse, Doctor. What's the matter with her? I, I can't tell. She's got an awful pain in the stomach. Uh, all right, Luther. I'll start right away. You get on back to it. Yeah, I sure will. Dave, this might be a good experience for you. Come along. I'm, uh, I'll show you the uses of a wire cutter, a shovel, and a revolver. wasn't thought too much of when I was a kid. Folks were convinced that all lawyers went to the eternal tropics and all doctors were there to meet them. <laughs> you see, a man didn't need a degree to be a doctor. Some of them just bought a textbook and read it and then set up in business. I decided I was going to be better than that, so I worked as a farmhand till I could afford one suit of city clothes and could pay $100 to end the medical school. Doctor? Yeah? How, how much farther is it? Oh, about three hours more. <laughs> that is, by taking the shortcut. Oh, oh, girl, oh, best. Hand me the wire clippers, Dave. What for? So we can get through that fence. That's our shortcut. I think we're lost, Doctor. You can't see any landmarks at night. Don't need them. I steer by the stars. <laughs> I guess they didn't teach you celestial navigation in medical school. I'm beginning to see they didn't teach us a lot of things back then. Hey, oh, 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 girl, oh, oh, come on now. Get up, get up. Uh, it's no use, we're stuck in a mud hole. Yeah, uh, gotta fill it up with gravel. 
Get out the shovel, son. That dog's going for bass. I'll change his mind in a hurry. Did you hit him, sir? Uh, of course not. But a mean dog can cause a runaway horse and a turned over buggy. An injured doctor's no good to his patients. Oh, good as new. Huh. Must have been a little something she ate. Mr. Whitcomb, do you mean you you brought us half across the county for an upset stomach? Well, that's what docs are for, ain't they? Well, good night. I gotta get back to bed. I'm bone tired. He's tired. <laughs> Save your steam. Save your steam, Dave. You'll need it. <laughs> Starting to snow. I hope you charge that fellow fifty dollars for this call, Doctor. And charge him a penny, son. Didn't do anything. <laughs> Even if I did, I'd be sending Luther my bills for the next ten years. He's a deadbeat. <laughs> then why didn't I come? Because, like Luther said, that's what a doc's for. We're almost home, Dave. Just turned into Main Street. Oh, oh I know why you sleep in a buggy. Not the only chance you get. Oh, Doctor. Dr. Fred. Morning, Emily. Oh, Doctor, could you come in the house and see Dad? He isn't very well. Miss Denslow, the doctor's had a hard night, but uh, I'd be glad to do what I can. Oh, right. Thank you, Mr. Grant, but Dad would prefer the doctor. All right. Let's go, Emily. Dave, you want to come in? Emily might fix breakfast. No, thanks. Mr. Grant isn't hungry. Up, Bess. Mr. Grant has seen all he wants of country doctoring. Mr. Grant's going back to being plain Mr. Grant. Well, what caused all that? Oh, several things, Emily. Maybe what we went through last night, but more likely just the sound of one little word. He's a proud boy, Emily. Well, he'll never be our doctor. I I don't like him. You know, I'm glad to hear you say that, Emily, because those are the classic symptoms. With women and the common cold, the chill always comes before the fever. <laughs> In a moment, we will return to the second act of The Horse and Buggy Doctor, starring Lionel Barrymore. It was the Greek poet Homer who first used the expression, winged words. In fact, the idea must have really caught his fancy because he repeated the phrase no less than 46 times in the Iliad and 58 times in the Odyssey. Well, unfortunately, most of us are not poets. We feel, but we find it difficult to put our feelings in words. Yet we are quick to recognize words that do express our meaning, and on seeing them, usually say to ourselves, why, that's it, that's it exactly. And this is exactly the remark you hear most often around the Hallmark display counters at stores everywhere. For the makers of Hallmark cards know that a greeting card must be of good design, must be in good taste, but above all, must say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And Hallmark cards do just that. They give wings to your thoughts. That's why every day, more and more folks, when selecting a greeting card, look for the Hallmark on the back. Next time, why don't you? It's certainly a comfortable feeling to know you can find a greeting card that truly expresses your thoughts while it reflects your good taste. And to know at the same time that when you send a card with Hallmark on the back, 
your friends will know immediately you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of The Horse and Buggy Doctor, starring Lionel Barrymore. The weeks passed into months and young David Grant was still a doctor without a patient. There was nothing to be done except to stand by, to wait, and to listen impatiently to an elderly gentleman who seemed so hopelessly out of date. This is the country, son. We don't have big city hospitals and dignified surgeons parading around in starch white coats and smart-looking rubber gloves. We operate in our shirt sleeves, on kitchen tables, by the light of kerosene lamps. Stay by the bedside, my boy, even when you know there's nothing that'll save your patient. Beyond medicine and beyond surgery, there is still something you can offer. Just being there, the last comfort in the final loneliness. I'm going out on a case, Dave. It's just routine stuff. So why don't you take the evening off? It's Saturday night and there's a dance down at Community Hall. Forget about medicine for a while and start remembering you're young. Good evening, Miss Denslow. Oh, hello, Mr. Grant. I was wondering if you ever got out socially. Well, I'd like to make a beginning. That is, if, if you're free for this dance. Oh, yes. Uh, I'd love to. You've been keeping very much to yourself, haven't you? You're not angry with the whole town, are you? No. It's the other way around, I'm afraid. How are people going to find out if I'm a good doctor when they won't try me out? I can't wait forever, Emily. Thank you. For what? For calling me Emily. Oh, uh, Mr. Grant. Hey, uh, Mr. Grant. Yes? Uh, remember me, Luther Whitcomb? Yes, I do. Well, my wife's sick again, and I can't find the doc. Uh, you know something about medicine, don't you? Mr. Whitcomb, if you're asking me to leave this dance and lose a night's sleep just to treat your wife's stomach ache, the answer's no. Oh, but you got to. She's awful sick. Come on, Emily, let's dance. I'm sorry. You'll have to find yourself another partner. What? Dr. Fred told me once that you had the makings of a fine doctor. Well, it's too bad that he's wrong. You're not a big enough man, Mr. Grant. You haven't a big enough heart. Good night. Emily! Mrs. Peters is holding breakfast for you. How about coming downstairs? She's been telling me some sort of nonsense about you leaving. I am, as soon as I can finish this bag packing. I see. Well, at least you can have breakfast first. Luther Whitcomb found you last night, didn't he? Yeah, wife's fine now. It wasn't just another stomachache. It was a ruptured spleen. Well, news gets around fast, don't it? <laughs> All over town that you went out on a call that I refused. So now you're quitting. As I am. Doctor, you better come downstairs quick. What's wrong, Mrs. Peters? It's Mr. Stevens and Mr. Crocker. They both say their babies are crying and feverish and, and choking up with something. Oh, wow. Diphtheria. If an epidemic gets started... Mrs. Peters, forget about breakfast. I don't know when I'll be back. Poor man. I've heard him say there's nothing more terrible than to sit by a sick child. Mrs. Peters. And nothing more wonderful than when it opens its eyes and asks for its doll. If it ever does. Mrs. Peters, would you unpack my bag for me? I, I won't have time. But... I thought you were... The doctor's going to need help. I'm staying. How many?
many new cases were reported today, Dave? Nine more, sir. You... Thirty-four babies, Dave. We got to keep going. We've got to bring that number down. I say there's a limit to human endurance. The two of you can't keep on day and night, day and night. Yes, we can, Miss Peters. Yes, we can. Because we're winning the battle. We're winning. You yeah. hear? Tell Dr. Fred to come at once. Dad fell downstairs. He's unconscious. Well, Emily, the doctor went out on a case. I don't know where he is. But I'll come if you want me. Well, I guess there's no choice, is there? <sighs> Emily. Yes? I'm going to need your permission to operate. It has to be done. One of the broken ribs has punctured the left lung. Oh, if we could only find the doctor. Emily, do I have your permission? Yes. But are you sure that... Do I know what I'm doing? Yes. Because one of the best surgeons and one of the wisest men was my teacher. We're kitchen surgeons today. All you need is a kitchen table for the patient and a dish pan for your instrument. Place a kerosene lamp on the sink and shine the light into a mirror so it reflects down on the zone of the operation. What's the pulse count now, Emily? Fifty-nine. See the whole operation in your mind's eye before you make the first incision. Then act quickly, surely. The pulse? Fifty-one. Speed, but not haste. Function like a beautiful piece of machinery, and so up fast. Put on extra blankets on the patient, stoke up the kitchen stove again, and sit down. And wait. Emily, your dad wants to see you. It's going to be all right. Dr. Grant. Yeah, yeah, it was, Sarah. Nice to see you, Dr. Grant. Thank you, Miss Butler. Good morning, Dr. Fred. Morning, Dr. Grant. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Mr. Riley. Good morning. Dave. Oh, I'm glad you did. You look and run Come for back somebody again next Sunday, won't you? Hmm? Oh, oh, no. Well, in case you are, I think I saw her waiting outside. Oh, huh. Yes, uh, by the way, son, I guess I ought to tell you I'm taking a vacation. First time in ten years. Do you think you can handle everything for about three months? I'll do my best, Doctor. Ah, I know you will. Well, Emily, can't remember when I've seen you looking prettier. Good morning, Dr. Fred. Dave, don't you think she looks wonderful? <laughs> Say, how about my giving you two a ride home? Buggies right down here. No, thanks, Doctor. I think we'll walk. Oh, yes, uh, we'd like to walk. Oh, well, all right then, all right. You mind on hitching best for me, Dave? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, oh, one thing more, Dave. Come here. Uh, while I'm on vacation... There's one bit of professional advice you may need to remember. Yes, sir. It's really a lesson in arithmetic. When a patient tells you something in confidence, how many people know it? Well, let's see. Well, the patient knows it. That's one. Huh? You know it. That's another one. Huh? And then you tell your wife. My wife? Yeah. That's another one. Now how many know it? Three, sir. No, 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 no. In this case, three ones make 111. You know, one, one, one. <laughs> 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 But, Doctor, Dave isn't married. A perfect diagnosis of the ailment, Emily. But I have a hunch Dr. Grant's about to undergo the correct treatment. <laughs> 
All right, Bess, come on. How about home? James Hilton will return in a moment. We seem to be on a classical plane tonight. First Homer, and now that renowned English man of letters, Samuel Johnson. It was Johnson, you know, who said, we must keep our friendships in constant repair. And at the time he said it, that wasn't easy. A visit to a friend 40 miles away was a day's trip. One letter meant hours with a sheet of paper and a feather quill, and often took weeks to reach its destination. How much easier it is nowadays, especially with all the help we get from the folks who sell Hallmark cards. For instance, right now there is a gift for you from these fine stores that is just about the best help to friendship I know. It's the Hallmark Date Book, a small, conveniently arranged day-by-day calendar of every month in the year. There's space beside each day for names of friends you want to remember on that day. There are separate pages for names and addresses of all your friends, a good way to keep your Christmas card list. Yes, the Hallmark date book and the fine stores that sell Hallmark cards certainly help us all to keep our friendships in constant repair. Ask for your free Hallmark date book tomorrow. Here again is James Hilton. You were wonderful as a doctor tonight, Lionel. You know, if you ever added up all the hours in your life you've spent playing a doctor, wouldn't they amount to something? Ha, ha, ha. Well, I can't think of any person I'd rather portray than a doctor, Jimmy. Besides being a wonderful profession, I'm sure it must be very gratifying to realize that your work brings happiness to your fellow man. I feel that way about acting, too. And I should think all of you Hallmark folks feel it, too. Your cards certainly do their part in spreading happiness. Now you take a little friendship book called the Hallmark Date Book Frank Gossage is telling us about. It's only a little thing, that's true. But it does its part in making the world a kinder place to live in. And the older you get, Jimmy, the more you realize that happiness is about synonymous with kindness. You know, I believe you're absolutely right. Well, here now, I I didn't intend to get up on a soapbox, Jimmy. (laughs) Why don't you tell us about next week's story on Hallmark Player? Next week, our play will be Madame Claire, a warm and delightful story by Susan Ertz about a fascinating family and their problems. And as our star, we are happy to have that notable actress, Agnes Moorhead. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. The role of Dr. Grant tonight was played by Lamont Johnson and Sammy Hill was Emily. Others in our cast included Margaret Brayton as Mrs. Peters, Joseph Kearns as Luther, and Charlie Lund. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at this same time. When Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Agnes Moorhead in Susan Ertz's Madame Wing, Donald Colross Petey is singing in the wilderness, starring Jean-Pierre Aumont. And the week after that, Charles Kingsley's Westward Ho on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the PBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.